Hello. I'm Sarah May Roberts. I'm one of the student members on the for the Community Conversation Series. And on behalf of the University Housing, I welcome you to this evening's event um, called Autism Unveiled, Understanding Its Meaning and Implications in the Deaf Community. The Community Conversations Series is a living and learning initiative of the University Housing, co-produced by the students of the Oregon Brain Tank, an undergraduate academic group of the, of the residence halls. I also wish to acknowledge our co-sponsors, the Robert D. Clark Honors College, the Oregon Humanities Center, Undergraduate Studies, and the, the U of O Libraries, who have collaborated with the University of Housing for the past eight years to make this series possible. So you've all heard of sexism, racism, anti-Semitism, but now how about autism? Autism is defined as discrimination based on the ability or inability to hear. Tonight, you will meet members of the local deaf community who, who will share their encounters with autism and their experiences growing up deaf in a hearing world. At this time, I'm going to introduce our moderator, Joe Larson, um, who will serve as our moderator this evening, um, both for the screening of the film as well as for the panel. And she'll introduce the panelists afterwards. Thank you to all our sponsors. Uh, a truly special thanks to uh, Sarah, a student volunteer, who decided to put this all together. I want to make a really brief introduction to the film because I want to make sure you have an opportunity to see the film, maybe learn a little bit about what autism is before we introduce the panelists. Um, the term autism, A-U-D-I-S-M, was coined actually in 1975 by Tom Humphreys himself a deaf professor at Gallaudet University at the time. And that word was introduced in a non-published paper and kind of floated around for a while. Not very many people knew what it was or even knew of the word itself, didn't make it into any dictionaries. And then in 1995, um, Oliver Stone uh, and Harlan Lane wrote some books, especially uh, The Mind Hears, and when that book was published, the word autism appeared in, th in that book again. And then people started wondering what that meant. What, what was this new phrase, though it had been around since 1975. And still, there was a little discussion about it, not much. And in the year 2000, uh, a new professor at Gallaudet University at the time, his name is Dirk St. Paulman, um, Dirk <coughs> I can't spell. I couldn't that way. Uh, was told he needed to teach a class on oppression. And the first thing that he did at Gallaudet University, and for those who are not familiar with Gallaudet University, it is the only college university of, by, and for deaf people in the world, and it happens to be in uh, Washington, D.C. And Ba Dr. Bauman decided that he was going to teach this class on oppression by starting out with this word, autism, because it seemed the logical place to have that discussion. And oddly enough, all the students in the class had never heard of it. And these were all deaf students. And this term applied directly to them. That would be akin to Howard University talking to their students and having a class on racism and having nobody understand what racism is. So after several panels, they decided they needed to do something more to really spread the word about what autism is. And as a class project, they developed this documentary. This documentary took two years to make and then took several years for public distribution. Has been available since 2008, and we're really hoping that you can help us spread the word. We have made it into many dictionaries, including Wikipedia, <laughs> but not into Webster's yet, on what autism is. In a nutshell, a story related to me not long ago by a deaf family was when they went to a, um, a carnival. And on one of the carnival rides, the deaf mother wanted to go on the ride, and the person who was running that ride said to her, you can't go on this ride, you're deaf. We can't let you on, it won't be safe. 
There were two children with her. One was her hearing son, and then the hearing son's friend. And the hearing son's friend had never been around deaf people before, had never seen that kind of thing before, and turned to the other young man and said, he can't do that. That's racist. <laughs> no, that's not racist. That's autism. So let's see our film. Thank you. I'm hoping that that brought up some things to think about. Um, now, at last, we can introduce our panelists. In fact, what I would like for them to do is to briefly introduce your name, history of your family, are they deaf or hearing, and uh, what kind of school perhaps you went to, mainstream residential school, and if indeed you ever went to uh, Gallaudet or another school that has to do with uh, residential school. Let's just stay there. Um, I want to keep the introductions brief, not because I don't love our panelists, but because I want to make sure that you have an opportunity to ask them some questions. All right? So, Peter, why don't we start on this side and move down? I was born hearing and I became deaf at two and a half. I grew up in the mainstream schools until I was 23. I went to high school, I went to college, I went to graduate school. And finally, I learned sign language in college. I took an ASL class in college. And I was mainstreamed, yes. Mainstreamed, I went to mainstream school. Can you understand mainstream, yes. The interpreter can understand. <laughs> My family's hearing. There's no deaf. They don't sign. I was born hearing, and I became deaf at five from spinal meningitis. And I grew up again in the mainstream school, which was an oral program. At the age of 12, I got a cochlear implant. And I have to say, for myself, it's been a very positive experience. There are positives and negatives generally, but for me, it has been very successful. And at the age of 18, I learned to sign, finally. And when I finally learned, I picked it up quickly. And I feel fortunate because I am in both worlds. I can go between the deaf world and the hearing world, but I feel most comfortable in the deaf world. My family's all hearing, no one signs, but I have a daughter who's one and I'm teaching her sign. And it's important for me for her to grow up that we can communicate and so that that's very important to me. I was born hearing in 1964, I became deaf at eight months old. And I again had spinal meningitis. I was in the hospital for two weeks. And the doctors thought I was ready to die. But I did get healthy. And when I was brought home, I was, you know, I was eight months. And how did I wake up? My mother would, she tried to clap to wake me up and I didn't wake up. And they brought me to the hospital and found out I was deaf. But really I was hard of hearing. For many years, I was hard of hearing. I could hear. I could speak. I didn't sign. Finally, at the age of five and a half, I lost all my hearing. So I now am profoundly deaf. But I grew up in the oral program. I communicated using speech. And I can remember speech. I can remember hearing some English. But in school, again, I was mainstreamed. I grew up in the mainstream from kindergarten to high school, but it was difficult. I needed an interpreter. I needed an interpreter for the school setting. I didn't understand when people were talking. And so then I graduated. I went to college. I went to what was then WASC, but Western, but now it's WU, Western Oregon University. And I came here to U of O and I graduated from U of O, and I used, an, 
I didn't use an interpreter and I really struggled. And for many years, I didn't feel connected and I would drop out and come back. And really for me, it was important to have an interpreter because I didn't have one. Oh, oh, I'm sorry, okay. My name is Linda Morton. I was born deaf. And my parents didn't know I was deaf until I was about five or six years old. Growing up, I would talk with my parents, and it seemed that I had a good speech ability. I could answer her questions. I went to a public school. And then fourth grade, they found out I had a problem with reading. They would ask me questions. And when I would answer, they, they didn't think my answers were correct, so I was moved to a special classroom where I would have auditory training and speech. And sign language was not allowed at that time. And they forbid sign language. And so I had to use speech and speech training all day. So I graduated and I went to Gallaudet University and that's where I learned sign language. And it was an amazing new world for me. There were so many deaf people and we were similar. So my family's all hearing. And so I finally felt connected with one group. I know there's still a lot you want to talk about. And we'll get there, I hope. Um, when was, if, really briefly if you could answer, when was the first time you met another deaf person? <laughs> Linda says, I was in fourth grade when they moved me to that special classroom and that's when I first met a deaf person. Well, child, a deaf child. Before that, I hadn't met any. And Roger says, for myself, the first time I met a deaf person was second grade. It was a classmate in second grade, and we actually grew up together. And it was nice for me because we could sign together. And that was my first experience. But with adults, I didn't meet a deaf adult until high school. This is Heidi, and my first experience with a deaf person, I believe, was fourth grade as well. And that was an oral program in an elementary school. And I noticed when I was pulled out for reading and writing support because I was so far behind because of my hearing loss that the, I worked with a teacher for the deaf related to my reading and writing. There was another boy, and I believe he was in third grade. He was one year under me. And he had a box and he had wires going up to his ears. And we really couldn't understand each other. We tried, but we couldn't understand each other. We couldn't communicate. So that was my first kind of realization of a deaf person. And Peter says, when I was two, my mother and I, we'd go to speech therapy and I noticed there were other deaf kids, and they were signing, and my mom would freak out and say, not my boy, he's not signing, no way, eek! So <laughs> I, it was really preventative for me from meeting those other deaf people. And so when I grew up, I didn't know any deaf people until I was a junior in high school, and I met a deaf man, and the two of us became friends, but we didn't sign. We would write notes back and forth. And he could sign, but I couldn't. I, you know, was lip reading, so. But my first deaf adult, I met in Pakistan. So the funny story is I graduated from college and I didn't know what to do, so I went to go work in Pakistan. My father sent me to Pakistan to work, go figure. And um, so I was working over there. I was all by myself. And I noticed two deaf men signing to each other. And so I met them, I got to know them, and I really found a deaf identity. In America, I did not, but I had to find it in Pakistan. <laughs> I think this is turned on, oh, thank you. Um, all right, wonderful film has a lot to do with, of course, discrimination. My question to the panel now is, can you 
briefly. Give us uh, any stories, um, personal or work-related perhaps, where you experience discrimination based upon your, number one, inability to hear, coupled with your desire to communicate through ASL. And anybody can answer whenever you want. Linda says, I grew up in the, using the oral method. And so finding a job wasn't very difficult for me. But during meetings, I would sit and everyone would talk and it was difficult to follow. And I didn't want to bother them for an interpreter just to be involved in the meeting and I did feel left out. And I felt, you know, I do have an advantage because I did get to work where others, where they were talking, but they didn't often talk to me. You know, they were talking while they were typing on the computer and I couldn't understand them and so it was difficult. I remember before college, this is Heidi, and I got a summer job. I was looking for some kind of a fun job to make money during the summer. And I remember I applied for a job, and I didn't get it because I couldn't hear on the phone. And maybe there were other things I could do than talk on the phone. But at that time, I didn't, there was no VRS, there was no video phone. And so that was really kind of awaken, a big awakening for me, and I couldn't figure out what I was going to do. Peter says, you know, now technology has really taken off. You know, you can sign on cell phones, you have video relay. And so I've experienced this with my kids. I'm divorced and my kids live in Wisconsin. And so for two years, I've convinced them, been trying to convince them, I will buy you a video phone, I will buy you a video phone, a webcam, a something. And they've been resistant this entire time. They have refused. We need a visual way for me to communicate with them. And it's really been sad for me. And Roger says one experience relate similar to Peter's as my family. And they're a hearing family. They don't know sign language. But right now with technology, you know, I'm trying to convince my parents to try texting on a cell phone. You know, but that's all. You know, I'm still trying to get my brother and sister to be more communicative with me with texting. But so how do we contact? We email. So I email and then I wait and then they email and we wait. And it's not instant and it's very frustrating. And Peter says yes. And Linda says, I would like to add to Roger's explanation. When I got my first TTY, which was a teletypewriter, it was huge. It was a huge box. Now they've changed. They're, they're a lot smaller. And my mother came to visit. And she's from Wisconsin. She came to visit. And she saw this small TTY. And she asked me, what is that? I said, oh, it's a TTY. For the deaf, they can communicate using the teletypewriter on the phone. And my mother was like, oh. She flew back home. <coughs> And she bought herself a TTY so she could communicate with me, and I was thrilled. I know we have many cases of unintentional autism, including how we actually set up the panel today in a straight line where some of our panelists can't see each other. Sometimes the room is not well lit. Sometimes uh, people forget to sign. Sometimes... Uh, interpreters aren't all in the right place, not all standing in the right place. There's a lot that goes on in terms of making things accessible and remembering to make things accessible and, as evidenced by my own class today, making sure technology is working in order to make things accessible. Any stories you want to relate about when autism really is unintentional and or when technology's failures have eliminated you from the conversation 
from participating fully in any family or work event. Peter says, I'm sure there are many stories. And everyone's looking at me, and he says, what's this? Huh, I guess I'll go. My experience with autism is related more with my experience with my cochlear implant. And I think it's important first for you to understand that with my cochlear implant that other deaf and hard of hearing have the same experience, we are all individuals. And so too often we assume, oh, deaf can lip read, oh, that deaf person uses a hearing aid, or that deaf person has a cochlear implant, they can talk. And that's not always true, and I want to make that clear. But with my experience, one time my hearing aid was broken and I needed to get it fixed, and so I went in to see the audiologist. And we were discussing fixing my hearing aid or maybe buying a new one. And they're expensive, and so I was looking at all the different options. And out of the blue, the audiologist asked me, so have you ever thought about getting another cochlear implant? And so she thinks, I think it would be a good benefit. Have you ever thought about that? And I said, no, I'm not interested. But I didn't explain why, and so we left it at that. And she said, well, do you like music? And I said, yes, I like music, but I can't always understand the lyrics. And she said, oh, well, I bet if you get another cochlear implant that will help you hear the lyrics and you could follow the song and you'll have a better appreciation for music. And so in the back of my mind, number one, that was a big assumption. She doesn't know me. She doesn't know my history. She has not seen my audiogram. And so that was, you know, I was very young when I got my, my CI. And so when I got my first CI, they said I could hear music. And so now the audiologist is offering another cochlear implant, and that'll make music better. And so when I left her office that day, I felt really kind of upset. I was, I was thinking, she doesn't know me, but I was more concerned about parents with young, deaf, and hard of hearing children who don't really have the options laid out for them. And what does she tell them? Maybe some benefit from a cochlear implant and we'll do very well with it. That's great. But what about the others who maybe will not benefit or who don't want the cochlear implant and don't have support? Where's their support? And that's what I'm concerned seeing. I've seen that happen a lot, especially as a teacher for the deaf. Was your parents very supportive to you when you had your first? Yes. Yes. Peter says, I think five years ago an audiologist came up to me. It was my first appointment to get my hearing aid fixed. So I went into the office, and she looked at me and she said, uh, have you ever thought about getting a cochlear implant? And she didn't sign it. And I said, have you ever thought about learning sign language? <laughs> and that kind of shut her up. <laughs> I, my answer. And did you see on the film talking about the need to fix us? So we are capable of functioning better in the hearing world. And that's fine, but there is a limit. There is a line. There is a boundary. And sometimes I think that that's not always respected. And Peter says, why do I teach ASL? Because I used to teach deaf and hard of hearing kids in a mainstream school. And I left because I felt like I was forced like I was being oppressive to those students because hearing aids, speech teaching, trying to do everything all at one time, those kids were forced to hear and to speak and with cochlear implants and fixing and fixing. And where's the sign? Where is the deaf identity? Where's the deaf pride? 
And the kids themselves really wanted, they were starving for knowledge, they were starving for sign, they were starving for language. They wanted that self-esteem. They felt because their parents were forcing me to force on them to maybe ignore the important part of what's inside and I quit. And I decided to teach ASL. And Roger says, a little bit about education, the same with Peter. I felt it was very oppressive, again, for deaf and hard of hearing students. I remember at a past job, a hearing teacher that could sign, but their philosophy was that deaf needed to, the deaf kids needed to talk, and most of the time in meetings what would happen is we would, I would sign and the hearing person would talk, and then they, the other person would sign, and the hearing person would talk, and I wanted that one-to-one -one communication. I didn't want to have to look in all directions, and that seemed to happen in meetings very often. And Linda says, I can communicate with a few hearing people, but when it's in a group of people, I feel very isolated because I can't catch the communication, because it's going so fast, I can't figure out who's speaking. You know, at parties, at weddings, or whatever place where you go where there's many people talking, I always feel very alone. And people ask me, are you all right, are you all right? And I say, yes, I'm fine. Maybe I look like something's wrong. But, you know, I wish people would learn sign language. It just makes it so thrilling for me to be able to communicate with people more smoothly. And Heidi says, I would like to add about when you have a signing environment. Like for example, my classroom. I have an elementary school classroom and that's a signing environment and that means that deaf and hard of hearing students teachers, we all use sign, we all use sign language to communicate. When people come into our room, they respect that. For example, I think just the other day, two adults came into my room and they were teachers for the deaf, and a teacher for the deaf and an interpreter, and we were having a side conversation in my room. But they chose to sign. The two that came in, they didn't have to, but they chose to sign because they were in the signing environment, and to have a communication on the side, it's just respectful to sign. And if you choose not to sign, that would be an insult. And also, outside my classroom, in the hallway, we sign out there too, because that's still part of the signing environment, people coming and going from class. And so, here at U of O, I teach a class, and I see sometimes the class you have a person who comes into class in a signing environment, the teacher is signing, the students are learning to sign, and we're practicing American Sign Language, but the students, some, sit in the back and talk during sign language class. Is that autism? That's my question. So Peter says sometimes we establish a sign signing deaf events here in the city and people show up and they know there are deaf, it's a deaf event and they try to sign for a little bit and then they just decide it's not worth it and they talk and, and that's autism. Now that hopefully the audience knows our panel a little better, you've had the benefit of the film and the benefit of hearing a little bit about some of the experiences on the panel. I am hopeful that you have some questions that you would like to pose now. I know we have a limited amount of time. We could talk about this for hours, but I want to make sure you have an opportunity to ask some questions. Question for Joe. <laughs> <laughs> My question is, your parents are deaf, and you've seen other things, oh, the deaf couple. What do you do? Let me repeat that question. <clears throat> yes, uh, both of my parents are deaf. I was raised signing as a first language, English as a second language. I have seen since day one people, mm, whatever that word is, that, what's that word? 
Interpreter, help me. <laughs> Rejection, thank you. Rejection of ha, our deaf families, deaf friends, relatives, etc. I have seen um, and felt. But worst of all, not just seen and felt that, but I've heard it and elected not to tell my family that hearing people were saying that against them. Because otherwise I would be spending all my time actually telling them all these negative things. And to me, that was something to cherish. And those stupid hearing people didn't know what they were missing. So we have known, we know your backgrounds in a mainstream school, speech therapy, hearing, you know, we've, we've learned about culture. But do you remember the day, the moment, the exact time when maybe you learned you weren't hearing and maybe you became more deaf or you found your own deafness? Peter says, I graduated from college and I didn't know what the hell I was going to do with my life. Like many of you, everywhere, and you graduate and you think, eek, what am I going to do? So... So I went to Spokane, Washington, and I didn't know what I was going to do. What am I going to do? I graduated from college. No, what am I doing? So my father, he's a pastor in a church, and he knew of a place in Pakistan where I could go work, and it was a metal shop. And I was working with boys, helping them learn how to make things with metal, and so I thought, great, I flew to Pakistan, and I was there for six months, and I struggled, and I struggled, and I struggled, because here in America, I could li read English, I could read lips, but in Pakistan, forget it. <laughs> People were speaking, and I, and I was like, is that English? And they'd say, yeah, and I'd say, wow. For six months, I struggled, and I was so alone. And talk about being alone. I really felt lonely, and that impacted me. Wow, I'm really deaf. And that was the moment of clarity. I was working alone. I was living alone. And that's when I met those two deaf men signing. And I was instantly drawn to them. And it was like the heavens opened. <laughs> and the lights came down. And I, I went to them. And it, it was amazing. My life changed. And from then on, it's been, it's been different. And Linda says, I was born deaf, so I don't know that impact of figuring that out. And Roger says, really, for me, when I realized that I was deaf, um, you know, I already knew about deafness, about my identity, about it being a deaf person as compared to a hearing person. But for many years growing up, you know, I thought I was hearing and I was speaking and I was using my eyes visually, and I was meeting people in high school and college, but still I didn't feel connected with the deaf community. And so I graduated college, and I think it was about 10 years and I didn't sign. There was no socialization with people from the deaf community, and so I was f trying to figure out what I wanted from my life. And later is when I decided I would go back to school to get my graduate degree in deaf education. And I began to socialize with the deaf community again, and it was amazing. It was me. It was myself as a deaf person, and I could sign, and that's who really I am. And I found that, and I was, it took me 30 years to figure it out, but now I feel like a success. And Heidi says, mine's brief. My experience is very similar because really it was a process. And I remember one day that it really hit me, just like Peter. I think I was in high school on the deaf volleyball team. They were all deaf women. And we had a practice in, in Los Angeles. And we, had, we were practicing there. And it was a very high level because we were getting ready for the Olympic Games. And the rule was all hearing aids must be off. So to play during practice, we had to have our hearing aids off. 
And, you know, I'd grown up in mainstream and it was an oral method. And I was learning a little bit of sign language, but I thought, oh, taking those off, I'm not comfortable. Oh. And that was a struggle for me. And finally, I took it off. And I was signing and I picked up some signs and I picked them up faster. And as I socialized, as I saw what was going on, I wasn't as worried because I could see on a hearing team, you have to watch out because people scream, you know, I've got it, I've got it. But I wasn't worried that I was going to miss anything because on the deaf team, it was more visual and it was so much easier for me. I could felt like I could relax, like I was free. And I was really sad when I left that to go home and I realized that was my true identity and I found it there. I thought I saw some other hands, no? Really? You know everything there is to know? Jake? Um, you want me to talk a little bit of sign? Um, so going to different countries and stuff, how is <coughs> seeing that sign and seeing also that um, the culture, how is it different from the U.S.? Um, Roger says, I don't know. I really haven't experienced that. I missed part of the question, Heidi says. A repetition of the question is, how are the science systems different and how are the cultures different? Well, first of all, their sign is different. They have different sign languages, just like spoken languages. They're different. You go to France, they speak French. They sign differently. So what, what do you think about, you were talking about Sweden, Peter. I don't know, Peter was talking about Sweden is more advanced and they have um, the technology, Heidi says. Mm -hmm. And they are bilingual approach to education. And that, but that you know might be changing. And Linda says, other countries' sign languages, or here in America, if people from other countries come here and sign their languages, I think that's awesome. I think that's amazing. I learned their, their way of signing. Like, for example, a deaf blind person. I am fascinated with their way of signing because it's all in their hand. And it's amazing how they can understand when the interpreters sign into their hands. Communication, it's just a different way of communication. I want to add part of the question there. Um, <clears throat> Okay, we understand that, I'm hoping we understand now, sign systems are different in different countries. But what about different feelings of culture, different feelings of oppression, or what you may have felt when you were traveling internationally as a deaf person where you looked at much differently there than here, or is it similar? Peter says, oh, yes. Oh, oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so here's a story about my father-in-law. My wife is from India. And we went to India. She and I were signing. And so we went to go buy something. I don't remember. What was it? Food or something. Anyway, uh, and her father was with us. And so he's gone to that store many, many times. And he's hearing and he does not sign. And the store clerk asked the father-in-law, asked my father-in-law, what does Peter do? And he said, oh, he teaches sign language in America. And the clerk said, how do you teach sign language? And the father said, oh, you just write it down and show it to him. That's all. You write it and show it. <laughs> the, that's how the father answered the question. So I looked at my wife and I said, no, no, what did, what did he say? And she signed it to me and I was like, uh-uh, uh-uh, wrong, <laughs> wrong. So, you know, the parents are answering for the kids. This is not going to happen anymore. That's not in my world. Nope. So, yeah. so what I did was I said, okay, wait, hold on. Okay. I got the clerk and I was going to teach him how to sign. What's your son for computer? 
computer, computer, different signs. There's a few different signs for computer. Computer. Mine is computer with a C that goes up and down the arm. So I point. And the guy said, what is that? And the guy was blank-faced. So I signed it. And the guy was still blank-faced. And he looked at it and looked at me and looked at it. So I grabbed his hand and his arm. And I made him sign computer. And he just was very limp and he didn't really understand. And so he was looking at me like I was from Mars or something, from another planet. So what are you doing with your hands? And then I touched him to use his hands and he freaked out a little bit. And in, when hearing people experience sign in other countries, it is very different. It is a very different culture. And Heidi says, my experience working with the deaf culture and community in Africa, when I first day I went to that school, a lot of the deaf children came up to me. They'd never seen a deaf person before from another country. They were shocked. <gasps> They'd say, there's deaf people like us over the ocean? Other countries have deaf people too? They were shocked. And for me, that was shocking as well, that they had not heard of that. Of course, there's deaf people everywhere. That was my experience. But for them, that was really an eye-opening experience for them. Did you learn any of the other country signs? That was the question. Yes. It's funny, because before I went to Africa, I was really, really nervous about going because I was afraid that I wouldn't be able to communicate. You know, so I worked at a teaching college, and it was all hearing staff. And how was I going to communicate with them and the students? And I was so nervous. And so we'd had um, exposure before where we would talk about our fears. And funny, because the volunteers would talk about their fears with snakes or spiders or no water or no electricity. And then it was my turn, and I would talk about communication. That's huge. I'm flying to another country and I'm afraid that I can't communicate. And so I lived there for one year and when I came home, that was the end of my fear. And I picked up their sign language really fast. It's very visual. And through their sign, I was able to pick up some of their spoken language too. And they helped me. And it's really, it was amazing. I learned so much. I know that our time has run out and I know everybody's exhausted. I want to um, bring this to a reluctant close. Um, for those of you who are interested in finding out more information, the University of Oregon Libraries has put together um, some information and referral on the U of O Libraries page. Uh, many of us are very available by email and other methods, so if you have questions or desire any follow-up, please feel free to write afterwards if you would like come up and ask us. Community Conversations also posts this as a, I'm looking at Dr. Kevin Hatfield, who knows all, but I know nothing. Um, and how might they access this particular panel so they know where to go after that? It's, it's on the same. Okay. Community Conversations is on that same University of Oregon Library web page, and so you can also, thank you, access this panel again if, if need be. Um, thank you to all our sponsors. Thank you for your support. I'm hopeful that you've learned something, but I am most hopeful that you go away from here still thinking about what it is we've talked about, assisting in spreading the word and talking to friends and family about this particular new concept, but not that new, this word that perhaps you've heard for the first time tonight, autism, and I'm hoping we have unveiled it just a little bit for you. Thank you so much to all the panelists for giving up your time, and thank you again to Community Conversations and Sarah for putting it all together. Thank you so much, and good night.